So, in the last class, we learned something about how to do self tuning in a filter. We learned the control circuitry, how a phase detector can find out the phase difference between the input and one of the outputs, low pass or high pass output, and get the average information regarding the phase as its output and compare it with the reference and the comparator output is used to control the master. And this will make the filter get tuned to the incoming frequency. Now, this com concept has been exploited in what is called as monolithic filters and currently it is called as continuous time filter. Okay. You will see why this is going to be called continuous time filter. Uh, instead of uh, monolithic filter presently. Let me talk first about the history of filtering. The filtering is the most common signal processing activity in electrical engineering. Uh, I would say uh, 80 to 90 percent of signal processing activity is just filtering. That is linear signal processing activity. There are other nonlinear signal processing activities. Okay. Rest of the linear activity is just amplification. So, if you leave out amplification and filtering, there is nothing left out in analog signal processing. Now, filtering has been done earlier in the olden days by passive filters, LC filters. <coughs> Primarily, because they are lossless components ideally, L and C, okay. and there is no problem of stability etcetera, which would normally occur in the case of an active circuit component. There is no need for power supplies. Okay. These are the reasons for these becoming the basic components for building any higher order filter. So, in fact, in the olden days, almost all types of filters had been designed for very high orders, and the tabulations are already there, variety of filters. So, the design is already there in a normalized form. Okay. So, anybody can look up a table and design his filter for his requirement by just looking at the values, normalized values. So, the filter design was very simple affair. In LC filters for example, the frequency was always equal to 1 over 2 pi root L C. Whatever be, it might be uh, just 1 over 2 pi root L C or 1 over 2 pi L 1, L 2, C 1, C 2 okay, to the power of 1 by 4 and so on, right, depending upon the number of uh, order of the block, okay, etcetera. The frequency, pole frequencies, etcetera, okay, will be determined in the following fashion. The obviously the sensitivity of L and C okay, to F is determined from this, it is half minus half, right, because the square root is coming. Okay. And L and C were very accurately fabricated, one could therefore fix the tolerance of this F very accurately with this passive L C filters. But for low frequency applications, we found that these L and C is used to become very high okay, because low frequency L and C values will have to be large and the size has to increase. And therefore, the size was a problem with passive L C filters. Okay. The size was a problem. And when 
people wanted to go to micro miniaturization and monolithic filters, there was no way of fabricating L. L was not available. Okay. So, the question was how to do filtering. Then we came up with an idea called active RC filters. This was around 1970s when the op amp had become available. Okay, and the transistors are uh, also very much in usage, and people were fabricating, let us say, some small scale integrated circuits at that time. Okay, differential amplifier and uh, op amp, etc. And using these small scale integrated circuits, one could get rid of L by simulating L or think of the whole process of filtering as a problem to be solved wherein you are using op amp in combination with R and C in order to simulate the filter in its entirety. Filters design is a question of solving differential equations okay, or integral equations and therefore, using what is called as integrator block, one could therefore, solve any filter problem using merely active RC components. But the disadvantage of this however, is that active devices are prone to stability problems, the op amp etcetera. They have frequency limitation okay. and R and C is had to be accurately designed. That is, that was not the problem in discrete circuit design using active <coughs> components along with R and C discrete components, thin film, thick film components. We could build fairly good active RC filters. So, this replaced most of the LC filters okay, when these uh, integrated circuits were made available. The stability problem was there. Okay. Size was much reduced, but still this has not solved the problem of making the entire thing monolithic because in the monolithic filter R was not satisfactory because it had very poor tolerance of the order of 30 to 40 percent. C was also having poor tolerance about 30 to 40 percent and therefore, effective tolerance of frequency in this case was 1 over 2 pi R C was unacceptably large because this is 30 to 40 percent, this is 30 to 40 percent effectively the frequency was deviating by 60 to 80 percent from what you wanted this was not acceptable because of poor tolerance. Not only that, the R's and C's had poor temperature coefficient, okay? large temperature coefficient. So, this was not acceptable for any design of a decent filter in monolithic form. And at that time, a solution was proposed as to using the active device in a monolithic block itself as an integrator. It has its parasitic capacitor okay, or a small capacitor which can be used okay, for uh, fixing the time constant and then obviously, you had a problem because it is parasitic or it is characteristic to that particular device. How you can get rid of poor tolerance and large temperature coefficient and there the idea of master slave concept was proposed. Okay. What is this? Let us see, it is exactly similar to our concept of current mirror. 
wherein we had used instead of vol uh, voltage control filter a diode, a transistor as a diode in the negative feedback configuration to make it accept a current, collector current of whatever that you are fixing and develop a voltage okay, to sustain that current and thereafter use this voltage in order to bias all the other base TMT junctions so as to sustain the same current in all the transistors. Now, the same principle is in a sort of little bit complicated way is going to be used here okay, to get over the major problem of poor tolerance and large temperature coefficient. Okay, what is this? The assumption is in a fabrication of a monolithic <coughs> component, all the components have same temperature coefficient and same absolute value. Okay. If all components have same absolute value under the same condition of operation okay, and same uh, temperature coefficient, then let us assume that we have designed a voltage control filter block using the same blocks that we have mentioned in the last class, the uh, KHN filter block wherein the resistors are replaced by FETs. So, the control voltage for the FET is going here and the input and the low pass or high pass output is taken and you use the phase detector to get the V average corresponding to the phase and compare it with V reference and control this. Now, if this works satisfactorily, we have shown in the last class that this will be automatically tuned to the incoming frequency which is omega reference. So, this control voltage will at all times adjust its value at all temperatures under all operating conditions, it will adjust itself such that this particular thing band pass filter or the pole frequency of this filter whatever it is low pass or high pass is automatically tuned. Okay. That means, for this we had known that omega r uh, master is equal to 1 over R D S of the FET okay, into C master. Okay. Is this clear? R D S of the FET into C master. For these slaves, we have omega slave 1 is equal to 1 over if you say that similar FET is used for the control applying similar control voltage to the gate or same control voltage to the gate, then R D S will be the same in all. So, R D S divided by C slave and omega S 2 is going to be 1 over R D S into C S 2, so on and so forth. You can connect any number of such components, any number like this without any limit. Okay. That means, all these slaves get the same control voltage that the master gets. Now, it is established that omega m is same as omega r by the feedback loop okay, at all times. So, now let us take the ratio omega r divided by omega s 1 is therefore equal to what is it C s by C s 1. Okay, let us call it by C m or omega s 1 is equal to okay, omega s 1 is equal to omega r into C m by C s 1. Omega s 2 equals omega r into C m by C s 2. This was established. Okay very clearly and therefore, now it is a constant frequency reference frequency which can be made as stable as you please into ratio of capacitors belonging to the same block and therefore, this ratios will track very well as far as their ratios are concerned and the temperature coefficient is concerned absolute value of the ratio is concerned okay, and temperature coefficient is concerned they will track very well and therefore, this is fairly accurately fixed. Therefore, you are capable of now fixing independently the pole frequencies of all these filters, which you can now connect in any manner you like. Input and output are free. 
So, you can connect these filters in any manner you like to formulate a complex okay, higher order filter block, any nth order filter. Okay, you can weld using cascading of these slaves. So, what happens then? That all these filters will have now a normalizing frequency which is omega which is under your control. Right? That means you can make these filters become programmable by simply changing omega r, they will retain their characteristics. Suppose you have designed these filters so that these filters are showing you let us say 10th order Butterworth characteristic. Okay? That is design based on what is the q of this block, what is the whole frequency etcetera, 10th order Butterworth. As I change omega r, it will remain 10th order Butterworth at all times, but its cutoff frequency can be continuously varied. Okay? So, this is the advantage of this kind of filter design. So, this has been now adopted okay, by monolithic filter designers as one of the techniques in realizing VLSI filters, analog VLSI filters. The only limitation now comes about because of the fact that you are using effect here whose dynamic range where it is operating as a linear resistor is quite small, which only means that the dynamic range for which this filter block can be used is quite small. That means if you can come up with techniques of making the dynamic range larger, that will be another contribution, research contribution here in this concept of continuous time filter block. Okay. So, these filters are nowadays uh, implemented for example, in television receiver uh, this was uh, implemented uh, and on an experimental basis by Philips okay, long ago and uh, around 1980s. Okay. This idea was uh, proposed around 1976 or so and uh, around 1980 or so. Uh, Philips at uh, uh, UK, they had uh, built an IC. Okay. It was not uh, op amp uh, filter, but it was a gyrator type of filter where inductors were simulated. It does not make any difference where uh, how you realize this filter. There was a master filter design and then the slaves design. Okay. The advantage of this kind of filtering in this uh, television block was uh, you had uh, frequency, synchronization frequency coming okay, from the transmitted information and this synchronization frequency could be used okay, as the reference frequency to tune okay, all the filters, the video filter, okay, the uh, what is that, uh, audio filter, everything was tuned by a master which was getting its input as the synchronization frequency okay. and uh, that way it was tracking with whatever was happening with at the transmitting end. Okay. So, this was a quite uh, good filter, there were a uh, large number of such filter blocks needed in a television receiver okay. and uh, that is when it was used first time as an application. Now, of course, it is being abundantly used universally in all analog signal processing blocks. This whole idea of master and slave was uh, evolved at uh, IIT Madras as an undergraduate project okay, uh, around 1976 and this was uh, published in Proceedings IEEE uh, of the same year. Right? So, uh, now we will discuss uh, concept which is again frequency locking similar to what we have discussed, but it is called phase lock loop. PLL popularly known as. 
PLL concept, you know, peculiarly was in existence for a long time, lying dormant somewhere. The few people who knew about PLL were only microwave engineers. And you can imagine, uh, you already know, there are very few microwave engineers in the world today, right? And therefore, only those people needed this concept because it was very difficult for them to get stable frequency output, okay? And they had to take recourse to what is called low from low frequency stable output, they had to multiply it to higher levels. And this kind of frequency synthesis was quite in you know, okay, for microwaves. And microwave itself, considerable advance took place, okay, during what? What time? Whenever uh, any advance takes place, it is pri pr primarily during war times, okay, Second World War and things like that, okay. The whole concept of radar, okay, and microwave uh, uh, sort of uh, advancement took place there and people were using this concept of phase lock loop, okay, during uh, that time for obtaining stable frequency output, but very few people understood the whole concept. Surprisingly, uh, it was proposed only for a radio receiver. You can imagine, it was not proposed for any radar or frequency synthesis. Somebody uh, wanted ideas for a cheap radio receiver. Lots of ideas came. One such idea, not very simple of course, it was very complex at that time. Okay? But a novel idea was phase lock loop. And uh, you can imagine a person who had proposed it, even though brilliant, was disappointed because it was thrown off. And the idea that was taken up was what is called as, what is currently called as super heterodyne receiver scheme, which was the simplest and the cheapest, okay. And uh, this phase lock loop was just kept away. Then when monolithic integrated circuits were coming in, to the market around 1970s, these uh, again those very few analog circuit people okay, were looking for some component which otherwise would have, wouldn't have become acceptable because of its uh, need for usage of large number of active devices, okay, but can be used in a communication application. So such a device was phase lock loop. And that was brought out. Thereafter, of course, again, uh, if you make these uh, multinationals take up any responsibility of fabricating anything, the first thing that they do is, okay, popularize the IC. Okay. So again, applications of phase lock loop were asked for, and uh, large number of such applications, novel applications, were put together in the form of a manual and given free of charge for everybody to learn the use of this component and thereafter it became very popular. That is the history of phase lock loop. Let us therefore see what phase lock loop is. Conceptually, it is totally different from all those concepts that we have been learning so far in controls. Actually, it is also a control circuit. What are the basic building blocks? Okay. You have obviously a phase detector. that we have already studied. How a phase detector can be designed as a monolithic block, we know. It is nothing but an XOR gate, right? Emitter couple logic, okay. So, it has two inputs obviously. Now, The output of the phase detector, in fact, phase detector is nothing but a multiplier, we, which we just uh, said multiplier in combination with a low pass filter. So, the low pass filter is nothing special and since I am going to use an amplifier here to improve the loop gain of this loop, okay, because if it is a control loop, always you have to improve the loop gain and therefore, obviously, uh, we have to put an amplifier. 
plus low pass filter. So, the low pass filter that is needed to average out the multiplied component is put along with the amplifier that is just an arrangement okay. and then you get the amplified average output and this has to be converted back to <coughs> phase information. This information which is a voltage has to be converted to phase okay. as a first step we convert it into frequency because we know that frequency and phase are linearly related. Okay. D phi by dt is nothing but omega. Okay. Rate of change of phase is nothing but frequency. So, it is linearly related. Therefore, I put a voltage to phase converter or voltage to frequency converter which is nothing but a VCO. which again we have studied recently as to how VCOs can be built using a what? Integrator and a Schmidt trigger etcetera. Okay. So, this block also we know how to build, this block we already know, this block also we have learnt. Okay. So, we know all the basic building blocks that can formulate what is called as a phase lock loop. Now, if such a loop is built, we have to understand how this now functions okay, in locking on to the incoming phase. Okay. Let us now discuss this. Let us assume that the input is coming here okay, and the phase detector is giving an output corresponding to the phase. Right. So, the phase detector has what is called as phase detector sensitivity which we had defined which we said is equal to k P D if you remember, right? We had already defined this for the phase detector that we had built. Okay. What is it going to be? It will be so many volts per degree radians okay, of the phase. So many volts D C okay, per degree radians. So that is the phase detector sensitivity K P D. What is the V average output? Okay, so V average is going to be a function of the phase. Okay. So, phase detector sensitivity is nothing but delta V average by delta phi okay, for any given circuit. And as far as amplifier is concerned, its sensitivity is defined as nothing but A naught gain. As far as the low pass filter is concerned, we will take the simplest low pass filter that is the first order low pass filter, then you have the low pass filter cut off frequency, we will call it as omega L p, which means this A is going to be A naught divided by 1 plus S by omega L p. So, that is the sensitivity of this. Then we are getting this D c, this D c is converted to frequency here. So, that means D C to frequency converter right? or it is nothing but K V C O which also we have decide, defined as so many hertz per volts or so many radians per second per volt. Please remember the units, so many radians per if it is omega output, radians per second per volt or hertz per volt. So, here it is volts per radians, right. here it is a ratio. So, this characterizes the linear assuming that this is linear, if it is non-linear we will assume that this is small signal okay, characteristics, we assume it to be linear characteristics of each of the blocks. Now, once again let us see this is a phase lock loop, it is the phase. So, that from here to here the frequency is automatically getting converted to phase because this is a phase detector, it is going to respond to change of frequency or change of phase okay, which is nothing but frequency. Right? So, strictly speaking if it is to be converted as phase what should happen? 
what is the relationship between omega and phi in terms of yeah Laplace yes into phi is equal to omega right or if it is phase it is omega by yes right so if it is phase that you have to put you have to put here this as kvco by yes that means here this is going to respond to the phase here at this point not frequency is this clear so the response for this is going to be like this input is a dc which is varying corresponding to which you are changing the phase here so that corresponds to kvco by yes so that that means it is radians okay per volt then now we have understood that this is the incoming phase this is the output phase okay if this is phi i and this is phi not this is with reference to some common reference whatever it be what it is going to respond is phi i minus phi not phase difference okay and output of that is going to be how much kpd times this right and that dc is going to be multiplied by a not by 1 plus s by omega dp it is not a dc it is a low frequency component right average is not necessarily a dc if it is time varying therefore phi i and phi not are time varying right average need not necessarily be a dc it may be a low frequency component therefore this is the attenuation or amplification factor this average component is going to be multiplied by kvco by yes and what you get here phi o is this clear so you can therefore consider this as nothing but what is this in an amplifier for example feedback amplifier stage what is this going to be this control loop you have learnt earlier xi xf right so what what does it mean what this is nothing but gh what is it called loop gain so this whole thing is called okay loop gain we'll call it k l okay we'll call it k l as the dc okay divided by this is the dc loop gain divided by s into 1 plus s by omega l so how do you get this phi not is going to be k l k l is where equal to k v c o into a naught into k p d it is simply go through the loop multiply all the sensitivity factors you will get the d c loop gain right k p d a naught k v c o okay k l divided by s into 1 plus s by omega l p into phi i minus so if you rewrite this as phi not by phi i you'll get this as 1 by 1 plus s by kl plus s squared by kl omega l. is this clear if kl is very high if the dc loop gain is very high this will become equal to one that is like in any case unity gain amplifier of ours right if this is for example vi and this is vf okay then it is established that if gh is very high vi should be equal to vf that is voltage follower similarly ii is equal to if it is current follower right so 
you have the similar concept in voltage follower, current follower, now it is phase follower. Okay. Is this clear? So, that means this is very nearly equal to 1 or d phi naught by because we do not have any absolute phase here, right. There is nothing like phi naught by phi, phi. it is always with respect to some common thing. So, phase difference d phi naught by change in phase at the output will track the change in phase at the input at all times and therefore, this is a phase follower okay, equal to 1 if k l is much much greater than 1. So, this is the linear analysis okay, for a phase lock loop simple enough and what is therefore, called natural frequency of this loop you can call this as the natural frequency of the system, right. Omega naught is root of k l into omega l p. We know this any such transfer function can be written as what? This can be written as 1 by 1 plus s by omega naught q plus s squared by omega naught squared, where omega naught is going to be root of k l omega l p that is called the natural frequency of the system. Okay. What it simply means that if it is high q system, it will give you maximum response at the natural frequency and q is going to be equal to what is by comparison you can see that q is going to be root of k l by omega l p. Obviously, we want to make the omega L p frequency very small and K L very large and invariably most of the phase lock loops okay, are high Q systems, okay, very high Q systems. Okay. Now, this is important K L is what is called as the DC loop gain root K L into omega L p is called the natural frequency of the phase lock loop. Okay, and if you plot this, right? That is magnitude of d phi naught by d i versus the frequency of this. What is this? Frequency of change of what? Phase. The frequency of change of phase. That you have to understand. The phase is the input here, but that phase itself can change at a certain frequency. That means it is called what? Frequency, okay. Phase is changing at a certain rate, okay. That is called frequency. And that itself can change. That means it can be a FM, right? Okay. If there is no change in phase, Okay, there is no frequency, but if there is change in fact, there is frequency. So, now this frequency itself can change, that means there will be f m. So, that means okay, if I give an f m here and that f m, if it is modulated at a certain frequency, it is that frequency that we am talking of, okay. it is not the carrier, it is the rate at which the frequency carrier is changing okay. and then this will follow that. It will be 1 and here this is d phi naught by d i. What does it mean? It is also equal to delta omega naught by delta omega because they are linearly related. This is how I come to conclusion that if there is phase locking, there will be frequency locking necessarily, right? Because I cannot discuss it in terms of frequency changes because I am assuming a linear system. So, I have to necessarily discuss it always in terms of small changes in phase. Then I go back, I say once phase lock occurs, there must be frequency lock. That means invariably, if I am inputting a certain frequency here, output has to track the input frequency. 
So, these two frequencies will be always one and the same. That is why in a phase locked loop, there is frequency locking. Okay. So, that is the basic concept of phase locked loop, a very simple concept. Okay. It is a concept which is quite often understood in controls when we deal with amplitudes. Okay. Whereas, here we are dealing with phase and that is the only difference. Now, let us understand once again. At a certain frequency, constant frequency input omega i, which is the same as what is called free running frequency. Now, let us call what understand what is free running frequency. If there is no input frequency at all, VCO will run at a certain frequency because there is a quiescent DC. This is a quiescent DC and VCO will run at a certain frequency. There is one frequency input, there is no input here. So, what will be the output? Just this same frequency okay, will come okay, with a small value. Actually, if it is an ideal multiplier, nothing should come because there is nothing connected here. Right? If at all something comes, this high frequency comes that is getting filtered out by the low pass filter. So, nothing comes here. That means, this uh, DC voltage remains same and this continues to run at the same frequency. So, this is called the free running frequency of the phase lock loop. Let us call it omega naught q, like quiescent voltage for a uh, voltage amplifier that is the starting point okay, around which voltage can vary in a quiescent voltage. Here, this is the starting point around which frequency can vary. So, I assume there is no input and I sh have shown that this free runs at omega naught q. Now, suppose, I give omega naught q here. This is omega naught q, this is omega naught q what should happen? According to the principle of phase lock loop, there is same frequency, nothing should happen. Is this? That is, this frequency should not change, because I am feeding the same frequency at the input. That means, the, what should be the output here? 0. That means, the control loop should adjust out its output, so that this is 0. When does it happen? When, we, when do you get 0 output in a phase detector? when the phase difference is 90. Huh? 90 that we have established. When the phase difference is 90 degrees, we get 0 phase shift. That is the quiescent state of existence. You understand? So, automatically, if I feed an input frequency which is the same as the free running frequency, the quiescent phase shift is adjusting itself to be 90 degree. So, as to make this voltage equal to 0 and so as this does not change, so that this volt frequency does not change. So, the quiescent phase shift is established when incoming frequency is same as free running frequency. Is this understood? And that should be sufficient for today. In the tomorrow's class, we will see how another situation exists. Okay? Now, the frequency is going to change from omega naught q. Okay? If this frequency changes from omega naught q by a small amount, what should happen? This should follow. How does it follow? Because frequency will always be the same. How does this loop make it follow? Let us understand that. We now said this is going to be different from omega naught q by a small amount. That means, these two frequencies are different, corresponding to which now this will establish a leverage, okay, which is going to be magnified and applied here, which will change it to that frequency. Okay. That means, there will be now a phase shift, which is different from what? 90 degree, because that we need an error output here okay, to sustain that frequency. Okay. So, this output will correspond to okay, what? 
that that is necessary to sustain the DC voltage that is necessary to sustain this change in frequency, right? So omega i, if it is omega i, which is different from omega naught q, omega i minus omega naught q by kvco is the voltage necessary here. That divided by a naught is the voltage necessary here, and therefore that is the voltage, okay, which is appearing as the phase detector output. So you can find out the phase difference corresponding. We know the phase detector characteristic, okay. Is this clear? So that means it will keep on changing the phase from 90 degrees on either side of 90 degrees depending upon whether omega i is higher than omega naught q or less, less than omega naught q. And up to what point can it go on now? Strictly speaking, if everything is working satisfactorily until the phase difference becomes equal to basically 180 degree or 0. That means change in phase shift becomes equal to 90 degrees on either side of this 90 degree. It can. That is what is called the lock range, because beyond this range, it cannot any longer sustain this condition that input frequency should be same as output frequency. In any given phase lock loop, if everything else has good full dynamic range, then the lock range is determined simply by what? By this, okay? K V C O A naught and Kp. Right? So you can find out. You can keep on making this omega i minus omega naught q divided by kvco divided by a naught. Okay, should be the maximum voltage that you'll get for a phase shift of phi by two, and that will give you omega i limit. Okay, on either side of omega naught q. Okay. If you take a linear phase detector, okay, it is going to be simply KPD, KVCO, uh, A naught into pi by two. If it is linear, because KPD into pi by two is the maximum change, right? KPD, KVCO, okay, KPD, KVCO, okay, and A naught into pi by two. This voltage being the maximum voltage change that can occur at the output. And that is the maximum, in that times A naught is the maximum DC change, that times KVCO is the maximum deviation that can occur at the VCO. Right? So, this is called the lock range, and this lock range is there around omega naught q on either side of omega naught q. So, omega naught q delta minus no, delta omega L to omega naught q plus delta omega L actually is the range within which this phase lock loop is going to have the frequency getting locked at all times. So, that is called the lock range. Okay. We will discuss further about other properties in the next class. Okay. So, please think about this new concept now that you have learnt. Okay. Go back to the hostel, think about it and come tomorrow because we will uh, try to understand uh, certain higher level concepts in the next class.